Just because I'm fat, that doesn't invalidate the things that I say. She died. You ready to get supersized? She died too. Today I've got the big fruit loop. <laughs> He's dead. Well, this is gonna be spicy. I'm Abby Sharp. Welcome to Abby's Kitchen. Today we're going to be unpacking this super controversial take by Blair White on the death of popular fat activists and the dangers of the fat positivity movement. Now, important heads up here, guys. These are some hot takes that may offend or trigger some people. And I was sent this video countless times asking me for my opinion on some of Blair's sentiments. So if you are new here, it's really important that you know that as a science communicator, I always come to the table with science. So my opinion is really just an interpretation of the research to date. It's not just how I feel. And I will always try to deliver information like this with as much sensitivity as possible while not diluting what the science says. That said, Blair and I obviously have very different tact, so please feel free to skip this video if you are sensitive to fat phobic language. Let me jump in here quickly to tell you about my sponsor today, Earth Breeze. So laundry has never exactly been one of my fortes. There's just like a lot of schlepping and sorting, and it's a job that never gets complete, at least in a house with two boys. So anything that makes it a little easier is much appreciated. These Earth Breeze Eco Sheets have totally changed the game. Unlike liquid detergent, Earth Breeze looks like a dryer sheet, but it's actually ultra concentrated laundry detergent with no plastic packaging. These sheets may look small, but they are super mighty. They can remove everyday stains and odors, like even my kids' stinky ski base layers, which I thought was not possible. And they're super gentle while doing it. My boys and I have really sensitive skin and I've been super impressed that these sheets are dermatologist tested, hyperallergenic with no bleach or dyes. And because I'm as forgetful as I am unskilled in most domestic duties, they've got a subscription service that saves you 40% that you can adjust, pause or cancel at any time with no hidden fees or penalties. And if one of your New Year's resolutions is to help support the environment and others in need, Earth Breeze has cleaned over 12,000 pounds of plastic and has donated over 100 million loads of laundry and counting to those in need. They also have a full money back guarantee. So to make the switch, go to earthbreeze.com slash Abby and get 40% off Earth Breeze Eco Sheets today. That's earthbreeze.com slash Abby for 40% off of your subscription. All right, folks, let's take a deep breath, maybe get some coffee and dive in. I consider one of the most damaging lies that is told by the establishment is that you can be healthy at any size, that you can be obese, and somehow happy. Okay, let's start with a quick overview here of the establishment, AKA the fat positivity or acceptance movement and health at every size. So fat positivity and health at every size or haze are two related movements that promote body acceptance for people of all sizes. Now fat positivity focuses more on challenging negative attitudes around fat bodies and promotes self love for folks who are fat. Whereas the priority of haze it's more on promoting a weight neutral approach to health that focuses more on healthy behaviors rather than just weight loss. So I've discussed my professional stance on the Hayes movement right here, but in short, I wholeheartedly agree with its core tenets. So weight inclusivity, health enhancement, eating for well-being, respectful care, and life enhancing movement. People will always come in different sizes and shapes where two people can eat the exact same diet and never look the same. And whether or not someone has always been fat or became fat through behaviors, I still believe everyone is entitled to respect. I also believe in prioritizing health promoting behaviors as our goals over arbitrary amounts of weight loss, since the former will generally positively influence the latter, but not necessarily the other way around. That said, I think that there are a lot of extremists within these movements that tend to take it way too far into legitimate disorder territory. And Blair has a lot of extremist examples showcased in her video where people are essentially co-opting a lot of the language 
to suggest that if you are not fat and actively trying to become fat, then you are not practicing self-love. Welcome to a day in the life of a fat activist. I start the day off feeding my cat some treats because she needs to know that unless she's fat, I won't love her. Then I film some TikToks, making sure to glorify obesity and show everyone how cool and trendy it is to be fat. If you're a fat person who is not trying to lose weight, I love you. Keep it up. So I think it's important to recognize that fat folks have a history of oppression that thin folks do not, or at least nowhere near the same degree. So I understand the need for a little extra encouragement in a world that basically hates them, especially because weight stigma and self-loathing actually results in a decrease in health promoting behaviors and an increase in weight over time. But I am strongly opposed to the position that you shouldn't love your cat or someone else if they are not fat. No different than I am opposed to skinny people saying, if you're not skinny, you're not worthy of love. I also don't think that we should be glorifying any specific body type. It feels just as disorderly to glorify the act of rejecting your body wisdom in an effort to actively achieve a fatter body than one would naturally be, as it is to starve yourself into an unnaturally thin body. So I actually agree with Blair that this kind of content is never okay. But moving on, one of the central arguments that Blair has in this video is that it is absolutely impossible to be fat and happy. Fat liberation, they say. They feel liberated. They feel free. They're happy. They love themselves. If you have a sneaking suspicion that that's all bullshit, you're correct. It's, it, it's clear as day to see these people are not happy. And the lie that these people themselves will tell you is that they are happy. But science has more and more shown that mental health is directly connected to gut health. Okay. So this is a very interesting argument, but way too flippant and inflammatory to have any real legs. One, she doesn't know the true affect of every fat person on the planet, so she cannot possibly know that none of them are happy. And two, she's not a dietitian or a neuroscientist or psychologist or any other credible source of information to explain the link between gut health and mental health. But I happen to know a little bit on the topic, so let's dive in. So first of all, Blair says that 50% of your dopamine is produced in your gut. So her assertion is that if you're fat, your gut must be in a state of complete dysbiosis. And if your gut isn't in check, you can't be happy. Her anecdotal evidence of this is that when she's bloated, she doesn't feel like going out. Okay, let's talk actual facts. As I discussed in my video right here, there's loads of research suggesting that fat people's guts tend to look different than thin people's. Namely, that there's a higher than normal ratio of firmicutes to bacteriodet bacteria. That said, we don't necessarily know what comes first, the bad microbiome inherited in utero or via early life experiences, or a diet full of low fiber, highly refined foods that prevent those good bacteria from flourishing and also causes weight gain. So a fat person who perhaps is eating in a calorie surplus, but is eating a lot of high fiber whole foods could potentially have a more favorable microbiome than a skinny person who eats a ton of sugar and meat, which I think is one of the important and evidence supporting pieces of the Hayes movement. Health can look bigger or smaller, even inside your gut. Now, as for gut health and mental health, yes, Blair is right that 50% of your dopamine is produced in your gut and your gut microbes mediate the communication in our central nervous system via the gut brain axis. There is plenty of really good research suggesting that gut dysbiosis can be linked to mental health disorders and neurotransmitter imbalances that help to regulate our mood. And we can't rule out that in a lot of these extreme morbid obesity cases, we may actually be dealing with a psychiatric disorder like binge eating disorder which has its own set of dysbiosis microbiome markers. When we look at the relationship between obesity and mood disorders like depression, we see a clear link, but this link is actually bi-directional. So folks with depression have a 58% higher chance of developing obesity, and folks who are obese have a 55% risk of being depressed. And one systematic review found evidence that this relationship can go both ways. So depression causes obesity, and obesity causes depression. Regardless, this association is multifactorial and way beyond just what gut bacteria are present in which amounts. Social stigma.
stigma, job discrimination, specific genes that encode for dopamine receptors, leptin, and other hormones that increase inflammation and can increase the risk of both depression and obesity. So 100%, our gut health is associated with our body weight. And our gut health also gives us insight into our mental health. But just because there are all these independent associations doesn't mean that we can say with absolute certainty that no fat person ever can be happy. Like that is a huge misinformed leap to make. Well, let's move on to Blair's history of the fat positivity movement and buckle up because it's wild. So if you ever had a sneaking suspicion that the fat positive movement is just a sex thing, um, there's some validity to that if you look at the history of it, which is actually very dark and scary. Enter NAFA, the National Association to Advance Fat Acceptance. And what they really mean is to advance the fat fetish. Because the leader, Bill Fabry, started this movement because his fat wife was getting ridiculed. Notice how there's no men in this movement other than perverts who are into fat women. You can see this is literally just some weird pervert trying to appease a room full of women that he has a hard on for. That's the history of literally where the fat positive movement started out of like a sex fetish group. And here's where y'all are going to say, Blair, you're kink shaming. I am. What are you gonna do about it? If your kink is like, you know, forcing someone or encouraging someone to eat themselves to death, you gotta be checked. Okay, so the fat acceptance movement started in 1967 with a fat inn in New York City's Central Park, which was followed two years later by the creation of NAFA, which Blair focuses in on right here. Now, Blair is right that NAFA has been criticized as encouraging fat fetishism and more problematically, feedism, which is a subculture that practices feeding women to encourage them to eat excessively and intentionally gain a lot of weight. Now, some people claim that this fetish is grounded in our evolutionary pleasure that we derive from food. Others claim it's simply about finding a particular body type, or in this case, fatness, attractive. And I think that both of those things are valid and and completely unproblematic. But an alternative, more sinister explanation for feedism is that it's fueled by men's desire to control, overpower, and even humiliate fat women. And like Blair, I don't mean to kink shame, but I do agree that even if the relationship seems consensual, that goal is super problematic. If the opposite attraction were true and we were looking at men attracted to hyper thin women and we had a man withholding food from a woman to see how small and frail she could become, we would be calling it out as abuse. So yeah, that's gonna be a controversial take for me, but I think any movement that encourages intentionally ignoring your body wisdom in an effort to cause bodily harm, and I would argue that forcing your body into morbid obesity is harmful, yeah, that is exploitive in my books. That said, Blair seems to suggest that any man who finds a fat woman attractive is a pervert. And that is not fair. If men can be attracted to thinness or big butts or brown hair or blue eyes, and no one calls them a pervert, why can't they be attracted to larger women? Also, the fat positivity movement, like any other social movement, has come in evolving waves. NAFA might have had a moment in the early 70s which seemed to be more skewed towards fat matchmaking and fat fashion, but the movement has evolved well beyond fetishism. So the second wave in the 80s and 90s focused more on anti-dieting programs and weight neutral models of obesity management like Hayes and the body positive movement. And now in the third wave, we're really seeing more research on the intersectionality of size discrimination and other forms of oppression. Now, the last thing I wanna to touch on is this. The famed foodie, whose real name is Taylor, died on Wednesday night. He has passed away from a presumed heart attack. I'm 30, I can't imagine having three years left in my life because I'm making eating videos on TikTok. His first videos, which never hit, that the algorithm never picked him up, he never got famous for them, were regular videos. And then as soon as he started eating crazy shit on camera, his shit went up. I'm getting paid to eat unhealthy foods and like gross people out on camera and it's killing my body, but it's making me money. It's very, it's very dark. It's very dystopian, like I said. He wasn't necessarily on camera talking about fat is beautiful, you can be healthy, but he was taken by clearly the idea that he can just live on and eat like that, which is a lie directly told by the fat positive movement. So 
I agree with Blair here. The mukbang or eating challenge trend is so problematic. Like this is nothing short of devastating. But Blair and I slightly differ on our interpretation of this situation. Blair solely blames these creators' tragic deaths on the fat positivity movement spreading the narrative that you can do mukbangs all day and live forever. Whereas I actually think that everyone else is just as much to blame. Like I said earlier, there are absolutely extremists in these movements who truly are glorifying getting yourself to become morbidly sick by eating fast food all day. But that actually feels like a bit of exploitation of the true intention of these movements by some fringe radicals. Most people who are fat and are benefiting from a weight neutral approach to wellness are not doing 10,000 calorie challenges every day and telling their kids that if they don't get super fat, that they won't love them. So while sure, it's very possible that the actions and belief systems of some of these young people were influenced by the extremists, and that is not okay, I think this wrongfully absolves the rest of us who consume this problematic content of our responsibility here. You know, I talked about this problematic phenomenon when I discussed Nikocado Avocado, Amberlynn Reed, and the mukbang trends in general. But I am strongly against eating excessively for views. Remember a few years back when Amberlynn Reed claimed that she was rebranding her channel after years of being known for her eating videos? She said this. I am mentally am ready and wanting and willing to feel better. So to do that, I have to say goodbye to the mukbangs. Unfortunately, people like to hate watch fat people overeat. And ultimately, money talks. So these creators go back to what gets them views, even if it's at the expense of their health. Same thing happened with Nikocado Avocado a few years back after he allegedly had a heart attack. I couldn't Every I took it felt like nothing was happening. Um, and I had to look at myself in the mirror and say, this is how I make my money. This is how I pay our bills. This is how we can afford America. I see our obsession with watching morbidly obese people become more obese, really no different than our obsession with creators on the other end of the spectrum, like Eugenia Cooney. Views, comments, likes, subscribers, all of these serve as positive reinforcement for the potentially disordered behaviors, especially when it's what's paying the bills. So folks, don't watch and concern troll driving that content up in the algorithm and contributing to the creator's sense of accomplishment and praise. Just do not engage. Do not watch it. Report it, actually. That's what you can do. Because as you can see, your viewership may be interpreted as support and as a result may inadvertently contribute to someone's demise. So yeah. Ultimately, I think it's really a shame that there are folks on the fringes of the fat positivity movement who are diminishing the real legitimate health or social benefits that these movements offer. I mean, we see this with literally every social cause, movement, religion, political standpoint, etc. The extremists may be the loudest, but they don't represent the masses. And that really f sucks. But I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Please keep the comments kind. This is a very sensitive topic. And also, if you're new here, please subscribe to the channel. There is lots more interesting discussion like this. Hit up my description for my free hunger crushing combo ebook and protein ebook. And I will see you guys next time on Abby's Kitchen. Bye!